Um, all right, five, six minutes of leeway has passed, and hopefully um, the mayor pro tem will be with us in just a few seconds. We have uh, three important topics that have been noticed for the study session. Mr. Eilman, which shall we take up first? Um, I'd like to uh, ask Sean Muir and her team from Interwest to address council, provide you an update with uh, how the design is going, the feedback that they've received so far pertaining to the uh, the north, uh, the park and, um, next to uh, Genesis. And uh, this is not the regional park that we've been talking about uh, at Portola and Frank Sinatra, which is on a little different track. This is the other one that is uh, much closer to Genesis. So they've been working on this for the last several months, giving lots of presentations over the last couple of weeks, and we'll be uh, sharing their progress and feedback with you today. Uh, fantastic. So just to emphasize uh, for those listening, this is the community park uh, close to Genesis and future affordable housing. And we're so excited to see all this progress. Yes. And good afternoon, Mayor, members of the City Council. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Sean Muir, Community Services Manager for Public Works. Uh, we're coming to you again with the preliminary conceptual design presentation for the North Palm Desert Community Park. And here's a helpful map to describe what you all were just saying. There are two uh, parks that are under design with the city at, the, at this moment. Um, the first is the community park located near Dinah Shore, uh, north and east of Dinah Shore, I should say. And then the second is a regional sports park, which may be located somewhere near the region of Portola and Frank Sinatra. And we're working with the planning department um, on that park as well. However, um, that is not what we will be discussing today. And the reason why we are moving forward with this community park first is because it is part of the Millennium Specific Plan. And as you can see in this diagram, um, the green space that is um, part of this map here is the location that we'll be discussing. So we started out um, by contracting with Interwest Consulting Group to um, both engage the public and come up with a conceptual design for the park. And starting off with that public engagement was on Engage Palm Desert, uh, where better. And we started a survey there to find, try to get some initial community feedback. We held two um, public open house meetings at the iHub uh, in the fall and in the winter. And then keeping that survey active online continued with the conceptual design. Um, since this conceptual design that you're about to see today has been uh, developed, it has been presented to this long list of um, committees and commissions, as well as um, homeowners and, and homeowners associations in North Palm Desert. And so we have some feedback for you today from those um, engagement opportunities. So first, we want to point out some of the uh, key positive feedback that we received. Um, in general, people were very happy that the city had engaged the public and taken the time to find out what their needs were. Um, we, got, we received a lot of positive comments on the design itself, and they want to know when it's going to be built. They really liked um, that it was a diverse and balanced park. There's a lot to do there for a lot of different people, and that it's environmentally friendly. So we tried to incorporate as much of that um, green opportunity as we could. Um, some of the other key takeaways, and these are uh, additional ideas that we heard. So more walking and jogging opportunities, um, jogging on surfaces other than just cement, um, places for stretching, um, lots more shade is needed, and um, EV charging. Uh, inclusion was a something that was pointed out as something to increase at the park. You'll see that the designs that you'll see today are ADA accessible. However, um, increasing those inclusivity options was something that we heard. Um, providing pollinator gardens or pollinator plants, and then also community gardens were other things that were pointed out to us. So we've still got some work to do. We're continuing to uh, work to address these. Um, but I think one of the members of the Planning Commission said it best when they said that this is just a very challenging site because of the wind and the sand. Um, we also have the noise from the freeway and the train tracks. And um, they want to us 
they want us to address safety. So there are a lot of developments coming in here. There are gonna be a lot of people coming in and um, having that safety component was important to the community. Um, we also heard about traffic and parking, um, ingress, egress, where the parking lots are going to be placed versus the new communities coming in, um, and then the park offerings and the budget. So these are some items that were pointed out as concerns and we're continuing to work on those through Can the conception. Wait plan. one moment until someone is encouraged to quiet themselves. Thank you. So moving on, um, before I introduce uh, Gianno Fioli um, from Interwest Consulting, and we're just going to go over what has been done to date, um, where we are in the process, and then show you these conceptual ideas for the North Palm Desert Community Park. Um, then we'll take you through next steps and uh, answer any questions that you have. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Gianno Fioli from Interwest Consulting Group. You have such a fun job. Thank you. It's a very exciting job. Yeah. It's a very exciting job. And we're very pleased and excited to be here to share with you our initial ideas. We do have 176 slides, so we're going to move through it rather quickly, almost like a movie. So we hope that this is going to be a great story time. Um, what has been done? As, as Sean mentioned, we had the opportunity to have several uh, uh, iHub uh, events and really engage with the public. Through that engagement process, we had an opportunity not only to collect perception uh, um, um, feedback, but also through the survey, we were able to collect more quantitative and qualitative data. Um, we did recognize after the, uh, the summary that we gave you um, back in January or February, um, that there, we recognized that a lot of the younger children and, and teenagers that that feedback was missing, so we had followed up with several stakeholder meetings with organizations and focus groups to make sure that we get a full gamut of everybody's participation. Did the dogs behave yes. during their focus group? Yes. <laughs> um, so we are talking about parcel nine in the Millennium Specific Plan. One of the things that uh, we needed to contend with was the fact that a drainage basin needed to be established here as part of a larger regional infrastructure. We work with your public works staff to come up with a two-tiered chamber system so that the, uh, uh, the uh, pre-treatment tr uh, retention basin will be the, the more frequently used one. Um, and if you can pick up the first half hour of runoff, you pick up the majority of the pollution that comes with it. So by doing that, not only do we minimize the, um, the overflow into the overflow basin, but we also minimize the potential for any pollutants to get into that area, which is the area that we anticipate uh, people are gonna use uh, more frequently. So where we are in the process, um, we are gonna show you designs that look pretty final, but as I've told everyone, these are not final. They are just an early uh, ideation. So we are uh, very interested in hearing your feedback on programming, vision, and approach. So let's talk a little bit about the park now. Um, what we heard from the community was that they really wanted a passive use park. They wanted to make sure that safety was addressed, the lighting was addressed, that flexibility, shade, and comfort were all, were all incorporated. The one thing that they did not want to see was structured sports that required large sports lighting, particularly because they were concerned about um, the a light spill that could impact the neighboring residents. Some of the elements that we heard from the community included uh, that they wanted open lawns, children's playground, splash pads, outdoor fitness, restroom, places with a lot of desert local landscaping and pavilions and picnic shelters, and of course a restroom which would be really needed. Things that we think that we can augment to the park include public art, disc golf. We heard a lot from the disc golf community. Uh, we're looking for opportunities to bring in structured shade so that we're, we don't have to wait the 10 or 15 years for the trees to grow in. Um, we did poll some residents about potential beach volleyball and basketball courts. Um, those polls were done in person when we were in the iHub, and we got really positive responses for, for those. Um, flexible plaza areas, places to gather, and uh, dog parks. Um, just as a reminder, the Millennium Specific Plan um, included uh, this park there, and it has the future affordable housing, 
that is already part of that um, component. When we looked at the site plan, we realized that they were providing an access on their east side. So we are using that access um, as, a, as a way to bring additional access to the park, but we also wanna recognize that there is access across the park off of Dinosaur into the community. So we're gonna talk about how we contextualize the park. For us, contextualization is really important. So when we look at um, the framework that we have together with the two drainage basins, we were a little bit concerned about the dead end quality that the shape of the parcel had. So we thought that by bringing access and by bringing levels of connectivity and programming, we were able to ease a lot of the concerns that we had with regards to safety, because now we're able to provide an opportunity for police department, um, even fire rescue, um, to be able to get access to um, that portion of the park that was a little bit more inaccessible. So as we construct the park for you from a programmatic standpoint, we're providing 170 parking spaces in two parking lots, the pretreatment and the overflow basin. We're gonna provide as much buffers as possible so that we can collect and, and try to deal with some of the wind and some of the sand. We're gonna provide three plazas as entry experiences into the park formally. Um, right next to the, to, the, to the parking lot, we're gonna have the large and small dog parks, a children's play area that's gonna be right next to a restroom. And we are gonna provide a operations yard and a storage yard. Because the one thing that we learned from doing parks is that storage is always at a premium. In the center, we're gonna provide what we're calling an activity core and a splash zone in what we're calling the, the cloud plaza. Next to those, we're gonna have spectator lawns, a botanical promenade that's gonna serve as a major access for connectivity, locations for large art sculptures, a continuous walking and jogging loop that's gonna be about three quarters of a mile. And along that, we're gonna to cluster together some exercise and fitness equipment. And what we wanna do now is give you a walk through the park. So starting off of Dinah Shore, as you arrive to the park, the first thing you're gonna see is a branding element that identifies the park. As a pedestrian, you're gonna have that completed streetscape experience. Um, right off of the circle, you're gonna have that plaza, which we're calling the Arts Plaza. The Arts Plaza is gonna have a welcoming opportunity to be able to provide some large art and public places. We've already um, uh, heard from the cultural affairs a committee is that um, the ability to think about a master plan, an arts master plan for this park would be really important so that we can get all of the infrastructure in place for uplighting or any other elements that are needed. But the quality of that arts plaza is gonna be one that's gonna be very welcoming. And the idea is that that is something that can be utilized for a series of different uses that are adaptable. Just to the north of that, you're gonna have a walkway that takes you down into the overflow retention basin. That's gonna be ADA accessible. Um, and then you'll go down that ramp into a plaza that doubles up as an opportunity for a flexible plaza. So that plaza, as you turn around, you'll see the entire drainage basin, but then on the flank side of it, you also have ADA stairs that will eventually turn into a stage seating. If you wanna have a small quartet uh, event in the park or a lecture in the park or something of this nature that can easily be accommodated. Through the terracing and the fact that we have to depress the drainage basin, we then treated the, the, the edges of it with, a, with an architectural treatment that sort of celebrated the terracing so that we could build as much opportunities for seating um, and some flexible uses in ways that otherwise um, uh, would not be afforded if we just created a, 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 a straight wall that just cut down. So here we're looking at, a, at what we're calling the, the Palm Cathedral. Um, it is a cluster of palms that will provide sort of a landmark moment. And then just zooming out and getting that overall view of what that drainage basin will look like. We are showing a full-size soccer field here that is full-size, full, size, full um, a league size. That is only there for scale. Um, we've been very clear with the community that um, uh, this is not gonna be an organized uh, uh, sports area in the manner that an active sports park would, uh, uh, would be, but it will be able to uh, accommodate the needs for practice areas and pick up games that some of the residents um, and some of the sports groups could use. 
Around the basin, we're gonna have a continuous perimeter walk. That perimeter walk is gonna take you all the way around over a weir that is gonna be the weir that's gonna separate the two drainage basins. We again talked to the cultural arts committee about how that could be an opportunity for a, a mosaic that could um, have some legibility um, and really interesting. Um, the idea behind the pretreatment basin is that when you have a large rain event, the pretreatment basin will flood first. And when you have your 100 or 500 year uh, rain events, then the, then the rain, the stormwater will overflow into the large uh, overflow uh, drainage basin. Again, that keeps, uh, that minimizes the amount of times that that will have to be used. I'm gonna walk you around the park. That continuous walk, it takes you back onto Dinah Shore and you'll get a sense for what that quality is. Um, the scale of that basin can accommodate a full-size soccer field, practice uh, fields um, up to U16 and U10, or a full-size uh, football field if flag football wants to be played there. So just some views within the drainage basin, looking around. And then as we come around back to Dinah Shore, we're trying to be as good neighbors as possible to finish that streetscape, create an edge that is a good urban treatment for the overall park. So just some views of what that experience would be like as a pedestrian. We're now gonna to move to the Garden Plaza, which is at the corner of Gerald Ford and Dinah Shore. That's gonna be one of the most visible plazas because it's on that main arterial. So there, what we wanna do is really celebrate the flora and fauna of the desert, create landscape environments that really maximize the utilization of the planting and really creates a sense of character and arrival onto that experience. We are gonna provide that parking lot that we mentioned right off of Dinah Shore. And these are just some views of how we plan to provide landscaping and buffer. Um, the entrance off of that parking lot is gonna be directly across from the entrance um, into the Genesis community. And the idea is that in order to prevent anybody from rushing through this parking lot to get into the adjacent community, we're gonna be doing traffic calming and taking measures to make sure that we're gonna do raised uh, speed bumps so that we can slow any cars down. Just a couple more views of what that treatment is like. If you are approaching the park from the east um, on Gerald Ford, you're gonna have a direct access into the park. That direct access is gonna be uh, 20 to 25 feet wide. It'll be wide enough so it can accommodate pedestrians um, and uh, children that are on a tricycle or on a razor. And that'll give you an opportunity to walk directly into the park past the, the raised uh, a crosswalk that we're gonna create into the Palm community as a traffic calming and past the um, service area that's gonna be on the back of the restroom building. That perimeter screening wall will be an opportunity for a mural. So we're already anticipating that that's something that, that can be a canvas for, um, for cultural expression. The restroom in that a yard is gonna be completely surrounded by a perimeter wall. So when you're in the park formally, you're never really gonna see what's going on in there. And that's really important to minimize those operations. So back of house remains as back of house. In the children's core, we're, we're planning for a large children's playground. The children's playground is gonna have a mix of structured and natural shade. Um, here, we're planning to incorporate as many imaginative play components as possible. Um, we are big proponents of nature play, um, but because nature play utilizes wood chips and all sorts of materials that are not necessarily appropriate for this climate, um, we are going to be looking for ways to incorporate the imaginative play and some of those uh, elements that are much more inclusionary. But the idea is that here, when, uh, when we design the park, we're going to be specking the larger trees to go in this area so we can get some more immediate shade as the park uh, goes in. So the children's core is going to be in the center, right next to the uh, large overflow basin and right next to what we're calling the activity core, so that if a parent comes to the park with children of different ages, they don't have to feel that they're sequestered in only one area. They're able to use um, easy sight lines that we've envisioned so that they can surveil and supervise their children. So that visibility is very apparent. We're trying to keep the space as transparent as possible. In that activity, in that activation core, 
Um, we are showing beach volleyball and two basketballs. We recognize that there is a sand issue here with the wind. We try to explore opportunities of doing a sunken beach volleyball pit as a strategy to collect the sand. Um, uh, but in fact, that activity core can fit quite a number of different programming components. And this is something that we're going to take back to the community to get some feedback to find out what is it exactly that residents want. We have heard from residents that if we put pickleball here, they're not going to play here because the wind is too strong. Um, uh, so, you know, but we still want to make sure that we pull that through the larger community and not just go off of the comments of a of, of few residents. So just some views of what that could potentially look like. Overall, the goal of the activity core is to build a sense of activity and a sense of uh, dynamism in the park so that it is not only something that services the children, but we're trying to build as much multi-generational opportunities as we can. So just some views of um, the basketball courts and the volleyball courts in the activity core, how that is gonna be viewed from the surrounding areas. We do have right next to that, we have the picnic, the picnic pavilion, we're gonna have some picnic pavilions that are gonna have um, their own sort of segregated DG play area so that if you do have a birthday party and you have really small kids, you, can, you have an area where they can be uh, close by and each one of them are gonna be outfitted with uh, uh, barbecues, which is something that we heard from the, uh, the community outreach. With regards to the botanical promenade, that botanical promenade is gonna be a sort of uh, a principal walkway and connective uh, a tissue that takes you from the parking lot on the east into the core of the overall park. It'll give you an opportunity to VC all the programming and all the offerings that the park has, always keeping within SEPTED. And this is where we're thinking about incorporating a lot of the pollinator components that we've, that we've heard. Um, we think that in this location, we can best shield the um, plants from any impacts of the wind and from the, um, and from the sand. So just some views of, um, of what that would look like from the, for the botanical promenade. The Cloud Plaza is gonna be on the, is gonna be formally the Eastern entrance off of the parking lot. We're calling it the Cloud Plaza because beyond it being um, an opportunity for branding, it also will be an opportunity for us to have a dry splash pad, um, a, a dry a splash zone where you're gonna have vertical jets of water, the kids will be able to play, get some respite or adults too, get some respite from the heat. And then that plaza um, can be utilized um, if you turn off the, the water jets for other activities. And right next to that, we're gonna have what we're calling a spectator lawns that are gonna be terraced in the manner that we've terraced the lawns by the drainage basin. Off of the parking lot, we are gonna have a large and a small dog park. One of the things that we learned through our focus group conversations is that dogs are a 24 hour use that brings activity. And we wanna capitalize on this activity to bring as many eyes onto the park as possible. We think that that brings, um, that the more activity that brings much more safety uh, to the overall park. We also put the dogs right next to the parking lot because we understood from the community that dogs don't wanna walk on the hot pavement. Um, so we also discussed about some opportunities of potentially using the fencing for metal art and components that could express culture um, and artistic expressions. So just a sense of what that scale for the dog park is gonna be. I'm clicking, there we go. Um, and then how that's gonna be co connected to the overall uh, botanical plaza and the, car and the cloud plaza that we're creating. On the far end, we are gonna be creating a, um, that uh, 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 operations and, um, uh, and storage area. In this graphic, it's on your right. So the idea is that that gets buffered with landscaping and a wall so that it doesn't become an eyesore. And just a sense of what that view will be like. We've also contemplated nighttime use in the park. 
We understand that um, because of the heat during the day, a lot of times in the late afternoon and early evening hours, that's when a lot of the public spaces get a lot of use. So we wanna make sure that we provide activity, safety, and good uh, um, um, security measures throughout the park. The idea is that as we get closer to Dinah Shore, uh, we become respectful of the comments that we got from the residents saying that they did not want a whole lot of light spilling into their neighborhood. So at that point, we will be lowering the lights down to bollard size um, in hopes of minimizing the impact that that's gonna have. Um, all of our light fixtures are gonna be in dark sky compliant. Um, and the only times that we're really gonna have a light spill is really gonna be any sort of architectural lighting that for up lighting reasons, there is very difficult to sort of uh, uh, control that. But we are looking, we, we still have to do some design explorations to explore those and see how we can minimize any kind of light spill that can be done. But just an experience, a view of what that will look like in the late evenings. We are looking at uh, shade devices. So um, we have created uh, two shade elements. And the idea that we've been exploring is if we do these with perforations, or if we do them as solid elements, we did hear back from the architectural review committee that they would prefer to see a more solid cover because of the amount of light that's there. They said that, um, that that would be beneficial. Our thought was that we could either do it with perforations or we could put in a polycarbonate um, material that's designed for outdoors that could um, provide and cast some color, um, some light color into the parking could be really interesting. Um, some of the comments that we got was that depending on how that's detailed, that could collect sand. Um, but those are uh, design explorations that we still have to do. So just a couple of views of what that experience would be and just a sense of what that material um, and how the material can be used. With regards to furnishings, we are looking for furnishings that have good certified uh, quality wood finishes that um, are not gonna get hot to the touch. We are looking to utilize ultra high performance concrete elements wherever we are gonna have shade. What's great about that is that because of the density of the concrete, it doesn't get as hot um, as regular concrete and it's very easy to pressure wash and maintain, which we think is really important. We're also gonna include um, picnic tables, drinking fountains with chillers. I will say that the drinking fountain that we are gonna provide is also gonna have a bottle filler. Because um, following COVID, we've learned that a lot of people just simply don't feel comfortable anymore drinking out of um, fountains. Bike racks, trash receptacles, separating the litter from the, uh, the recycling and opportunities for park users to charge their phone. And uh, uh, wherever we can, we're going to provide a doggy bag dispensers in the event somebody is walking to the park um, and the dog needs um, to be picked up after then those facilities are there. Uh, we've looked at the manufacturer and the play equipment, I mean, the exercise equipment that we're looking to cluster around the exercise trail. Um, and this is a manufacturer that the city already uses. Of course, the flora and fauna, we are only gonna use local and native. Um, we do think that this, part, that this park is in the desert and needs to speak to the desert. But we are gonna be looking at subsurface soil treatment so that we can um, expedite the growth of the roots of these trees so they can mature as quickly as possible. So in wrapping up, uh, we set out to do several things. One was to honor the commitments that the city had, respect the comments that we got from the residents, a deal with the, with the infrastructure needs that the park has to uh, contend with, create something that was well-organized that could be used both daytime and nighttime and create something that was responsive to the needs of the residents, a good neighbor, a park that is organized and functional, that it's performative and responsive, that it has a varied um, uh, set of offerings, that it's multi-generational, that it's, it's animated, it, it feels like a destination, it feels like it's somewhere you want to go to, it's adaptive and flexible. Uh, one of the challenges, Mayor, you gave me was create something that was not too prescriptive and that had some opportunity for growth. And what we've done is that we've spaced things out enough so that there is those growing and adaptive uh, opportunities throughout the park. 
something that is going to be comfortable and shaded and a place that's going to be safe. From, a, from, a, from an experience standpoint, we wanted to make sure that we created layered experiences so the parents don't feel that they're sequestered in any one area, that we create landmark moments that become iconic within the overall park area, and that those are set with and staged within an environment that feels like a place where we can celebrate our sense of community. So just to wrap up, our next steps are we are gonna have a second open house on August 5th at the iHub. We're gonna have a follow-up online uh, interview specifically targeting, uh, targeting some of the programming components and the finishes and detailing that we have yet to do. Um, uh, once we do that and adopt a final construction budget, then we'll take that through the schematic and design development and then bring it to you for final approval. And with that, I'll be glad to answer any questions. Questions? Council Member Troopy. Thank you for that presentation. Um, quick question, the, the retention basin, uh, the pretreatment basin. You know, I noticed that if you're in that area, the slope comes from the south and the, the pretreatment basin is kind of on the other side of the main basin. How do you direct, I would think that the water's coming down the slope from the south and yet that pretreatment basin is on the other side of the main basin. How do you direct water into that? Our understanding is that, and it's going to take me too long to get to the slide, but our, our understanding is that the, the connection is actually coming from the west. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Okay. That makes sense. And are there, I just can envision a little bit of a problem in as much as if you were to put soccer fields there um that people get accustomed to playing and they might say well without the without the flood lighting or or more expansive lighting that they might say well you know i don't get out of work until five or six in the winter time it's dark already we can't really utilize them have, have there been any concerns expressed about that or um no not from the residents we haven't heard any concerns of that nature with regards to creating a habit of usage and then that creating a desire to add the lighting we haven't heard that no. but they want sports fields for sure that's no what they want is they want a flexible area to be able to have yeah. games okay. um so that's why we're simply just showing the sports field just to give everybody a sense of scale because everybody you know soccer is so popular in this area that everybody sort of gets us an, an idea of how big a soccer field is it gives us a way to be able to communicate that okay. but formally this is at, at least the conversations that we've had this is not going to be a park where you're going to have a soccer field right. striped right Oh, I see. Okay. I got it. I thought the just weren't going to be regulation sized. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. Appreciate it. Quickly. One thing I haven't heard so far in this discussion, you know, I heard this is the second time we heard of Parks and Rec and now here. Um, cost. Is this within our budget? What is the anticipated cost if we were to go full bore on every single one of the amenities you're you're showing here? Um, I, I haven't pulled the full budget on this yet, but I think that we're targeting the $9 million mark um, for the overall park. Um, we think that that may be doable, partly because the cost for the drainage basin is coming out of another project. So that's alleviating some of the burdens that that's going to put on the construction cost for this park. Um, and the way that we strategize our parks design is that we want to put everything on the table and then... Um, what we're going to do is that when we do the construction documents, we're going to have several pieces that we may consider maybe over budget, if possible, we'll put those as add alternates with different variations so that then you get sort of an a la carte menu so you can pick as a, as a city which finish or which element you want. Mm -hmm. So that way, at the time of bidding, you get the most opportunities to make the best choices. And just two quick clarifications. The current budget for the parks for about $14 million right oh. now. So we're well within budget, it sounds like. I'm always hesitant to say that at this stage, but until we get bids, but um, about $3 million of the uh, $3 million is coming from the business assessment district. The city took that obligation on a number of years ago. It basically drains, she drains all the property from um, Gerald Ford and Gateway down towards this particular area. So there was two choices the city had, Evan, to answer your question. The first one was to essentially condemn all the property across from the gallery uh, for the strange basin or to come up with a different solution integrated into the park in this particular area. Um, and because we had also ag agreed to take on some of the drainage responsibilities for the University Park subdivision. So uh, it, it, it ended up being a, a very nice solution there. 
passive uh, park where people can go out and play, but you've got two separate sources of revenue. We've got $10 million setting aside for the city and $3 million from the business assessment district. I have a quick question and a quick comment. I see many rails and surfaces that would be tempting uh, to a teenager with a skateboard. Uh, so has there been any discussion during the community engagement about including an approved place uh, for skateboard use? Um, I don't, I don't, you know, off of memory, I don't recall hearing that comment from any of the residents. I will tell you that um, uh, when we go into detailing, we are going to be putting grooves and details into the poured concrete and cast concrete elements that essentially is going to dis dissuade individuals from grinding and, and um, damaging uh, the beautiful improvements that we're going to do. Um, a lot of the municipalities for whom we serve are facing that problem. So uh, a lot of them put metal metal pieces, which we don't think looks so great. So we're going to try to incorporate that. So, so it's, it's, so it's an issue you're ready for. Yes. And in terms of a skate park, uh, perhaps that's better saved uh, for the larger regional park discussion. Uh, the quick comment is, uh, thank you for putting parking adjacent to the dog park. In addition to that, uh, since not all the users are going to be able to park in that first row, uh, it's very helpful to make sure there's sufficient space uh, for people to pull up and quickly drop off uh, their dog before they have to go mm -hmm. park at some distance. So keep that in Thank mind. You. Thank you. Thank you for that feedback. Yes. First, you breezed right through that 174. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was impressive. Um, a couple things, uh, questions I have. You talked about speed bumps and SEPTED, and I'm just wondering, have we worked with the emergency to make sure that the, the while the speed bumps are creating a safe environment, it's not hindering in case of response, response to an emergency? Time. Correct. So I just want to make sure that we were careful with that, and, and our local public safety does great with SEPTED also. Um, the other thing, um, have we considered any cornhole games? <laughs> and have, I asked that because we put it in during one of our events, and it was one of the most popular really? things we did. So it's just something that I think it's a quiet sport. It, it mm -hmm. doesn't create a lot of mm -hmm. issues with mm -hmm. neighbors, so it might be something we look at. Yeah. The other thing that that jumped out at me is when I heard preferential EV parking, and that came up at a meeting I was in couple days ago that bothers me because just because you have an ev vehicle doesn't mean you get preferred parking mm. so i just want to make sure that what our goal is to treat all of our community members as well as possible and as inclusively as possible yes. and preferring a pre preferential parking for an ev doesn't necessarily do that so i just want to make sure that we look at that in the the biggest picture possible of course. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Madam Mayor. My comment is just excellent. As, as I mentioned in the Cultural Arts Committee, there was a lot of excitement about the possibility for art, for interchangeability. So the fact that you approach this from 12 to 15 different facets, anticipating the needs is phenomenal. So thank you and your team. Thank you very much. All right, go back to having fun. Yes, thank you. Next. Next up, I'm gonna introduce Deborah Glickman, who has been working on our uh, broadband project. So she will introduce our team from HR Green. I'm much shorter than the last speaker. <laughs> uh, quite a PowerPoint here, so let's get, keep rolling. Yes, uh, good, after, and good afternoon, Honorable Mayor and City Council. As the city manager said, I'm Deborah Glickman in the Economic Development Department, and I'm the staff point person for the broad, uh, broadband study. In September of 2022, 
The city contracted with HR Green to conduct a broadband study. And the purpose of this study session today is to update you on what HR Green has done today and to update you on next steps. HR Green will present feedback that they've received from the community as well as city council. They will um, present some possible models for broadband and then open up for a question and answer. We have three representatives from HR Green here today, one via Zoom, and that is Tim Jonason. And we have Ken Price, who is the project manager for HR Green. And then I'll go ahead and introduce to you David Zelnuck, who will do the first part of the presentation. He is also with HR Green. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, it's good to be here. David Zelenok, for the record, with HR Green. Delighted to uh, spend some time with you this afternoon. I've only got not 174 slides. That's probably the the the, the, the highest number of slides per second Keep I've ever rolling. seen. Keep uh, I only have four, <laughs> and Ken Price uh, following me has about a dozen. So we'll be uh, brief, and then we'll be gone. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, if we would, and the clicker. There we go. Uh, so. Forward. There we go. Ah, please. Uh, you know, uh, okay, I'm sorry. Can you? There you go. Okay, we good? Okay. Mm. Perfect. Thank you. So uh, very briefly, uh, this uh, sounds like a dumb question, but what is broadband anyway? And crazy as it sounds, there is a federal communications FCC definition of broadband. Very simply put, think of a three megabyte attachment. It could be a file, photo, a song, a document, uh, for whatever reasons, telecommunications people, and we'll be speaking a bit, not in megabytes, like a three megabyte attachment, but there are eight bits in a byte, and you'll hear us talk a lot about uh, megabits again. So a three megabyte file is about a 24, 25 megabit file. Uh, and if you have 25 megabits per second download, and you have three megabits per second upload, so you can download a song in a second, think of it that way, you've got broadband. If you can't download a song a second, you don't have broadband, very simply put. Uh, it's a little, a little oversimplified, uh, but, uh, but most, uh, by the way, most cell phones today, in fact, I think uh, Deborah checked hers earlier today, uh, and she's getting a whopping with Verizon, I think five-ish download and zero point something upload. So on her cell phone, it registered 5G, which didn't make sense, 4G. There's a lot of variability here and uh, we're hopefully here to help fix it. Uh, but I listed five things here, what, what I think really matters in broadband and deliberately I put speed as the fifth of five items, what really matters in broadband. Number one, uh, I hate the term, but there's not a better term, it's latency. Uh, if you've ever, I'm sure we've all had thousands of times you click a mouse, how long does it take when you click the mouse until you see a response back? That's kind of a good way to think of latency or the lag it takes for the system to respond. That can be very important if you're doing surgery remotely and you'll need a fiber optic connection to do that. You can do that these days. You have to have extremely low latency and they measure latency. I won't bore you with the technical details, but, uh, but latency when it comes to really mattering in the future of broadband is huge. Capacity, can the whole family be on at one time? Quality of the connection, of course, we all like to know and say that we're, we are staying connected. Uh, the lowest cost per bit, uh, how much does it cost to get your broadband? And uh, as I said earlier, I put speed as the fifth, arguably the least important to get fast. Once you hit the click of the mouse and you start the download process, they measure speed once the file download has begun. So uh, the point is everybody doesn't need them all and uh, different technologies equal different costs and different benefits. So, uh, there we go. Uh, obviously, how is broadband delivered? Uh, why the, uh, the telecommunications people tend to think in terms of wireless, uh, and we all know what a cell phone is these days, and I'll talk about that, and wireline. Wireless, obviously, satellite is making some huge uh, improvements. So Ken took a picture of uh, one of the latest uh, satellites, not a dish, it's a satellite receiver antenna on a rooftop there. I give satellite one star. It's probably improving to maybe a two star. We'll see improvements there. Uh, but there will be capacity limitations in the middle of Los Angeles. Uh, the, the cellular or the satellite service will be pretty, very poor, like a half a star. The further you get from the, from the urbanized areas, the better the satellite connection will be. Cellular 4G, 5G is kind of a blurry area. So I gave those two and three stars. On the wire line side, uh, you can have aerial. That's where you have overhead, some call them telephone poles. Think of it that way. Aerial, wire line, or underground, which is what you have mostly in Palm Desert, is underground wire line service. DSL is going away. Those are the old telephone uh, copper wire systems. Coax cables, many of us have seen those in our homes for years. And then I just brought for 
uh, for, uh, for grins and giggles, a piece of, this is plastic pipe called conduit. This is a two inch piece of conduit. Uh, and uh, if you'd like, I can pass these around. This is an actual piece of fiber optic cable. Uh, if you'd like to actually plug sure. one. Uh, so so uh, very simply put, uh, that piece of fiber optic cable is about a dollar's worth. Uh, and uh, uh, that one dollar's worth of it's about a foot, it's about a dollar a foot, a buck a foot is a good rule of thumb. Uh, that piece of fiber optic cable there could easily carry not just Palm Desert's entire telecommunications network, uh, but probably all of the Coachella Valley could pass through that cable. Is all you need these days. It's incredible the amount of speed, data, throughput, capacity, and the cost. Like I said, is about a buck a foot. So it's very amazingly high efficient. Uh, the electronics that go on the end of it go about a hundred thousand dollars a piece. Uh, but uh, but you look at the amount of throughput and the cost is just amazing, which is kind of why we're here. So uh, I gave fiber optic cables, uh, some call it future proofed. I gave that a five star. It has virtually unlimited capacity, which again is where we think the future of technology is going. Uh, all these, by the way, use fiber and we'd like to say there's no better technology today. My fourth and last slide really is talking about fiber to the home. And really if there's one foot stopper I'd like to make, one reason we're here, it's to talk about uh, getting fiber to the premise or fiber to the home, F-T-T-H is the obvious acronym. It's in the industry these days or in the, the lexicon or the parlance. Uh, but again, uh, what, the, what we're talking about here is to get a piece of fiber optic cable, we just pass through there into a typical home. There are a lot of variables in cost, but a good rule of thumb, 600 bucks to maybe $2,000-ish per home. Take the number of homes, take it times uh, high end $2,000, and that's the total cost for deployment of a fiber to the home, FTTH network, uh, throughout all of Palm Desert. Again, we're looking at these five, from where? These five major things. I'm sorry? From where? Oh, uh, uh, from a from what's called, a some call it a carrier hotel or a meet me point from a switchboard, basically. From a switchboard somewhere in the Palm Desert area, could be in Palm Springs, to your home, uh, the total cost divided by the total number of homes 1200 maybe $1,500, $2,000 tops uh, to get you this kind of technology. Uh, interestingly, when you look at the cost per month you're paying your cable provider these days uh, and the cost per year, you're probably paying $1,000 a year and roughly speaking, about $1,000 per hookup is what we're looking at. So you can kind of look at it that way. So with that, I think I've worn out my welcome. <laughs> uh, and I'd like to introduce my colleague, Ken Price, also with HR Green. Ken? Thank you, Dave. In the interest of time, I will click through a lot of my slides fairly quickly. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on project background, presuming council already knows that. Um, and then I'll also skip this slide where we talk about what's going to be in the study. Again, presuming council already knows that. Jump right into the meat of the the rest of these slides. So the first thing we did was reach out to our uh, stakeholders, stakeholder groups. So a number of people uh, on city staff, and then a number of anchor institutions, including your higher ed and your K through 12 school districts, regional entities and community partners. And this is an overview of some of that feedback and I'll just highlight some of it. Uh, the major broadband concerns in Palm Desert, I'm sure this is not a surprise to you, are speed, cost, security, reliability, expandability, resiliency, and redundancy. Cellular coverage, and I think, Mayor, you asked us to put a little bit of focus on the cellular coverage uh, during the study. Um, cellular coverage is decent in most parts of the city, but not along Highway 111 and south. There uh, doesn't appear to be enough uh, competing uh, broadband service providers in the city to meet the needs of residents and the business community. And we'll see further evidence of that as I go along. Unserved and underserved as well as low and fixed income communities need improved and inexpensive broadband, maybe even free. So we did a resident and business survey uh, over the months of February and a through April. And these are the different uh, communication channels that we spread the word about the uh, survey. We only got 138 responses. That's 126 residents and 12 businesses. So this is not a large enough sample size to say this is actually what's going on population wise. But I'm gonna share with you the results anyway, because they're very telling. So we have two maps here, the one on 
my left um, is demonstrating the speeds throughout uh, Palm Desert. So uh, you can see that there are a number of red dots. Those are less than 25 megabits. And then there's a number of uh, between 25 and 100 megabits. And then there are a number 100 all the way up to one gig. There are a few that are above that one gig speed. Let me talk just real quick about the less than 25. Uh, this is where you determine underserved versus unserved. So those that are up to 25, that's the maximum speed. Those are considered underserved. Anybody that's got 10 megabits or less is considered unserved, okay? The map on the, on the right is a breakout of the different providers with Spectrum being the predominant provider. So this is kind of a, a brief overview of some of the results. I wanna focus on reliability there. You see, we got some mixed results on the reliability side, 34% somewhat to very dissatisfied, 46% somewhat to very satisfied. And then the same thing on the uh, speed and rate. So 30% satisfied to very dissatisfied, 44% satisfied to very dissatisfied. Uh, and I really want to draw your attention to price. Um, wow. This is where we got a real substantial amount of feedback. 61% are satis satisfied to very dissatisfied uh, with, um, are somewhat dissatisfied to very dissatisfied with their price. And you can see there that the average price they're paying is eight, about $88 per month. And that could actually be a bundled price. The uh, top line here, again, summary from the survey, is about how often people experience outages. And that's not bad, actually. So 50% of the respondents said one hour or less per month. So that's pretty good. I would also like to draw your attention to the very last one. Um, and this is to, to you. 75% <laughs> of the respondents believe that the city should help facilitate better broadband. That's a big number. Next thing we did was a market assessment. And this is where we go to and look at online industry data about the service providers here in Palm Desert. And you can see that we've got three, what we call wired ISPs. So that's Spectrum, Frontier, and Earthlink. We have one fixed uh, provider, we call that a WISP, um, and that's Pacific Lightwave. And they're very active, I might add, in this community. Um, and then you have two satellite providers, most of the nation has two satellite providers, the same two. So this is what we found during our assessment. So there are eight residential internet options from five residential providers, seven business internet options from four business internet providers. Your average download speed is pretty good, 194 megabits, and your upload speed is pretty good too at 25. Uh, businesses have an average of just over, just under three uh, per thing, per uh, location. Uh, approximately 98 of the households have at least one provider. Uh, cable is the predominant channel through which most people get broadband. So 100% of the households have that. DSL is 98%. I really want to draw your attention to the fiber. Only about 12% of the residents can have access to fiber and only 18% of the businesses. However, one of the fiber internet service providers can provide up to 100 gigabytes of service. That's pretty impressive. The next thing we did was take a look at your current fiber and conduit assets in the ground. So what you see displayed here is the results of the uh, CV Sync project with CVAG. So this is phase one. This is in the ground today. So that orange that you see on either side of this map those, that fiber's in the ground today. This is the traffic signal uh, project that the city actually did. So this is fiber that's in the ground today that's owned and operated by the city to interconnect the traffic signals. And then this is what might happen, hasn't happened yet, might happen as a result of the second phase of CV Sync. So the blue lines are phase one, those are in the ground today. The pink lines are what's projected or proposed for CV Sync phase two. 
Prior to today's meeting, many of you responded to a, a survey that we put out just to you. We also shared it with some of staff, but what I'm gonna share with you today is just the results from, from you all. Um, so from this slide, the last three items there are really focused on cellular. And most of you seem to feel that you're very neutral about cellular services within the community. However, the, the top three on this slide indicate where your concerns are with broadband. And you all seem to be very concerned about broadband. And then the last one was again telling, just as it was for 75% of the respondents to the citizen survey, you all said that the, that the city should probably play some role in the deployment of fiber, with 60% of you responding that way. There are some other questions. I'll share with you some of the comments. So one of the things was to, if you guys had any comments with regarding the first nine questions. So Cost is a factor. It's important that we have, you know, equal uh, access to to the uh, to broadband. Um, you talked about needing input from the business community, which we did as part of the stakeholder engagement. Uh, and then some of you said that you haven't gotten any feedback from any of your constituents. So that was also very interesting. I guess it depends upon where you live. <laughs> Question number ten was all about benefits for the community. So uh, attracting businesses, economic development was a big thing throughout uh, the study to this point. Um, equal access for all residents. The telecommuting piece, we see, we, we heard that quite a bit from the business community, uh, that there are people moving into Palm Desert to telecommute. And then uh, improvement of quality of life. Question 11 was biggest concerns. Um, and this is where you all provided feedback about the current providers and the fact that they might not be delivering the best service today. And that competition is important, cost again. Uh, and then, of course, we need to be really good stewards with the taxpayers' money. So the, the last slide here is really where, and I hope we can go a little bit longer, because this is really the important part of, of our conversation here today is to talk about the different potential broadband business models. Um, so I'll, I'll start off by talking about the last one on there, which is where Palm Desert is at today. That's where everything is provided by the private sector. So they put the stuff in the ground and then they operate it and they maintain it and they deliver services over it. So that's where Palm Desert is at today. Model number four is making palm, potentially making Palm Desert what we call a fiber friendly community by adjusting your public policies so that it's easier for people to install fiber and those types of things. And that could include accelerated uh, reviews, accelerated inspections. Model number three is the model that in our experience as HR Green, we see most of our municipal clients go down this path, model number three. Uh, this is a model where the community, the city, builds what's called a middle mile or a backbone network to interconnect all of the city facilities and then potentially some of the anchor institutions like your public safety, your school districts, your, your libraries, that sort of thing. In this model, the city owns that asset. So you design, you build, you construct that asset, but then you reach out to the private sector to operate it and maintain it, and then potentially build the last mile, which is building it out to the residents and businesses, okay? Again, in this model, the city owns the asset, but you have somebody else from the private sector come in and operate it and maintain it. Then you don't have to staff up to support it, okay? So you just have that upfront capital outlay for the building of the asset but you don't have the ongoing operating costs. And then in addition to reaching out to have someone come in and operate it and maintain it for you, then you also reach out to the private sector to have one or more private sector uh, providers come in and provide services over it. So you're not responsible for operating it, maintaining it, or providing services over it. That's all private sector. Model number two, and this is what we see Ontario doing today, uh, they are going to build the entire infrastructure. So they're going to build not just the middle mile, but the last mile. 
And then what they're going to do is reach out to the private sector to put services over it. So in their model, they have to staff up to operate it and maintain it, but then they reach out to the, to the private sector to actually provide services over it. The last model is what they call a fully municipalized model. And this is typically uh, utilized by cities that already have some sort of utility. They either do have gas, electric, water, a utility already in place, and they just strap onto it a broadband utility. So this is where the, the city not only builds the entire infrastructure, but then they also deliver services over it. So they have to staff up to not only operate and maintain it, but also to offer a help desk and, you know, resolve ongoing problems. So with that being said, that concludes our, our presentation. This is really where we wanted to have an interactive conversation with you about uh, eventually trying to decide which one of these models you think the city ought, okay. to, ought to go down. Okay, let me down. give you some quick feedback. Okay. We could have shot from the hip and picked one of these before we hired you. <laughs> okay. We don't need you to stand up and ask us which one we viscerally think is best. We need you to give us informed, studied comparisons of the upside and downside of each choice so that we're better educated when we make a decision about which one we prefer. Got it? Okay. I think that's all the feedback you need now because it would be, it would defeat the purpose of being a consultant for us to just shoot from the hip in the same way we could have before we hired you. Interesting. And the, the whole reason there's a contract is because we found ourselves deficiently educated to make a good choice. Okay. And I'm fe still feeling deficiently educated okay. to make a good choice. I don't know more than I did before about the comparative upsides and downsides of these choices. Okay, well, we can certainly, we're scheduled to come back um, late August, and we can certainly take a look at that and, and bring back what you're asking for. Well, and this is so important and such a big ticket item. What I would ask of you and of staff is give us a report that we can study in advance uh, so that when we have that study session, we are prepared to ask informed questions. Okay, we can do that. Yes. One question I have is, is something that was posed by one of our residents, and I thought you were going to elaborate as um, Madam Mayor asked, where is it coming from? And you equated it to a Palm Desert switchboard. Well, where is that coming from? How far is the switchboard that's going to serve us? And what is the need for maintaining that? Because that was something that was a, of a big concern of a, a resident in a high IT field. And as you're mentioning that it's future proof, I don't quite buy it because that's what we thought of DVD players and then Blu-ray and now streaming. So technology is currently, you know, constantly evolving. So I don't really think anything is future proof. Thank you. Yeah. Council member Drupy. I, I do agree with uh, mayor Kelly in as much as I'd like to see how we're, how we would subsidize any cost of building infrastructure and, and all those potential models. Uh, to me, that's a huge question of between all these five choices, how are they funded, et cetera, et cetera. I know when we build roads, you fund them with fuel tax or, or bond money, whatever. Um, so that, that to me, that would help us make an informed decision. Understood. Anything else? Yes. Yeah. And thank you. I, I did learn a lot. I feel though I, I just want to know more. 
and I know that there are the funds that are available. There's a, a huge tranche of funds available for broadband mm -hmm. and how much that factors into which decision we can make, how much uh, with CVAG already, already having put in so much conduit and then the second phase of CV sync going in, what does that look like for us? Is there anything that uh, when we talk about the switchboard, uh, is there anything that says we have access to the scenic uh, wiring, the scenic fiber, or are, is that off limits to us? I, I, I didn't ask that question. I did talk to uh, mostly the institutions of higher ed that use that network. Um, I did not ask that question. We can certainly go back and, and probe that. Okay. And I would like to know how much um, of the funds that we can possibly get our hands on in these broadband sure. uh, discussions. So thank you very much. Okay. Great. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And um, open the sale. Thank you for bringing that. Visual aids are always helpful. Who's up? I'm good afternoon, uh, Mayor Council, Richard Canoni, uh, your Director of Development Services. Uh, the item uh, that we have for you this afternoon uh, is a discussion that we wanted to have uh, regarding uh, right away encroachments, uh, specifically for railings and planners. Uh, when there's some unique uh, uh, situations within our uh, within our downtown area, um, the current code allows for architectural elements and frontage standards to encroach into the right of way. Um, in addition, there was a um, El Paseo uh, design guidelines and, and cafe uh, standards that were approved back in 2013 that we still use today. Um, but it really there was some uh, as the uh, as this applies to some of the side streets, there was just some vagueness in the code as to what, what could be permitted or, or not. Um, we do have some standards for uh, outdoor dining for restaurants that's permitted, but we don't get into addressing uh, if there's any encroachments into the right of way. Um, so we have a, an application that's pending now uh, on Larkspur Lane, and just wanted to go through uh, some, of the, uh, some of the findings that we had and whether or not it made sense to uh, at least look at a policy in the interim until we develop a, uh, a full standard uh, related to outdoor dining overall within the, within the downtown. Uh, just a quick overview of uh, the, the D and DO, the downtown and downtown overlay zones. Um, the right-of-way encroachments that are currently permitted, uh, we do allow for um, uh, to be two feet from the curb, uh, awnings and a upper story room, um, which you can kind of see some of the images here. Uh, in addition, balconies, uh, bay windows, and eaves are permitted to encroach uh, three feet into the uh, into the right of way in both uh, both districts. And then for our frontage types, again, this really would apply for new construction. Um, there's three types of frontages that a uh, commercial building could have: either a shop front, uh, again with an awning encroachment two feet from the curb, uh, a gallery, or an arcade. Uh, both of those are permitted. Uh, two feet from the curb. In addition, um, the regulations also allow for the planter boxes or pots to be placed sort of between the columns as well as cafe seating uh, provided that uh, adequate uh, access is maintained. Uh, just a quick refresher, the El Paseo design standards in 2013 um, that uh, really focused on sidewalk cafes uh, allow for encroachment into the right-of-way provided that there's a eight foot uh, clearance maintained, and in some instances, um, under certain conditions, the director is allowed to uh, reduce that uh, to seven feet, and that does include um, the ability to put uh, railings in, in planner. So I try to get some images uh, pre-COVID uh, from Google Earth to show what uh, what was existing around that time. And then looking at at Larkspur Lane, some of the existing conditions. Um, this is a, a, one of the few areas in the downtown where we have our uh, streetscape or landscaping that's not adjacent to the curb. Uh, in this instance, the colonnade for this building uh, is at a zero foot setback. 
And then there was a raised planter uh, that was in this area that they have since uh, removed uh, that was causing some issues uh, both uh, in the planter itself uh, as well as within our sidewalk. So they're looking to uh, repair that possibly as part of uh, as part of this. One thing that we also did learn, um, there is a, a sewer line um, that runs through this area as well that actually drains the back of the shopping center where the loading dock is. Um, so it's a private line that kind of runs through this area um, that goes into a vault underneath the parking lot. So there's a lot, a lot going on in this uh, in this little area, but it's kind of created a a sort of a, a dead space that uh, we wanted to uh, possibly address. And so what the applicant is is uh, what they have proposed is within that three foot area um, is to essentially put a a railing. They would need to, if you re if you recall the 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 image, there's a, a slight. Um, uh, slant to the uh, elevation, uh, what they would look to do is essentially build that up approximately a foot. So it would align with uh, with the property, uh, with, with the colonnade, um, and then have a railing in that area uh, for outdoor seating in that, in that three, foot, uh, three foot dead space. So just on that picture, since it's at an incline, it can't both align with the column and align with the palm tree because the palm tree was below the column. Correct. This this makes it appear as though they're at the same height. Correct. But they would what they would need to do is build that build that up about a foot as well as include drainage, proper drainage for that area so it's not sheet flowing uh, across our across so our it's sidewalk. actually going to be above the palm tree. Correct. And the sidewalk. Correct. And so the discussion that we wanted to have today is whether or not um, those uh, the guidelines from El Paseo uh, be extended within the DNDO uh, in, in certain instances where you have uh, landscaping that is um, not curb adjacent, where, where you may have this dead space, um, but again, allowing a max encroachment of, of three feet similar to what uh, some of the other architectural elements or, or frontage standards allow for, um, uh, limiting that to, to railings and planners as well as uh, requiring a revocable license agreement. So it's not something that would be forever. And then if it were to close, they would need to uh, remove, uh, remove those improvements. Uh, one thing I also wanted to, to point out on the map, we did do just a, a overall survey of the area as far as where else this condition um, would, you know, could apply. And there is a, there is a building or a small area um, on Sage I think there's a, comp I don't remember the name of the building. There's a, I know there's a compounding pharmacy there. Um, it's right on the corner. They have somewhat mm -hmm. of an arcade. It's not directly to the sidewalk, um, but that, that you know, if, if th there could be a potential there uh, for something similar, um, but it's not as, not as uh, what I'll say severe um, because you're not at that zero setback. Um, so we did see where this would also apply, but um, that's what we wanted to at least bring up today for uh, discussion. Councilmember Arnick wanted to go to the prior yeah. slide. I, I'm just confused by this. They're going to build up that planter, right? C correct. Well, we're, if you look at, at the area here, there would so they would essentially build that up with with concrete, approximately one foot. Okay. So, and they're not touching the sidewalk. Not touching. The, there's some areas of the but, sidewalk that need to be. I'm sorry, to be repaired and replaced as a result of the old planner right. because it what it didn't drain properly so it sheet flowed across the okay i okay i'm i'm clear now i, I appreciate the and the then what do they Thank want you. to do with it what they would want to do then is within that 3 foot area put a railing around it and have outdoor seating because they would still need to maintain their ada accessibility to the building that's used um, within that colonnade and what business is it there? They're, they're targeting, right now there's no business. Um, I think it's been vacant for some time. And so they're targeting a restaurant use, um, but they were hoping to uh, target that use with the outdoor, outdoor dining to sort of activate it a little more. Uh, got it. So I could be totally misrecalling I didn't think we had to move forward. I didn't think we had 
help Sao specific um, outdoor dining guidelines. I thought those were, I thought we went out of our way to make them city wide. There, there, the design guide, there were a number we had outdoor dining that was permitted. And then the, at least from what I saw that in 2013, um, it was specific to um, El Paseo. And then I, I did find a, a request that came in front of in front of the council, I want to say in 2014, uh, for the French restaurant at the corner of Larkspur um, and El Paseo, where they do have outdoor dining along Larkspur. They wanted to expand that outdoor dining, um, and they were asking for an exception to even this, I think, because it, it was going to encroach further into the right-of-way. Um, and they ultimately withdrew their withdrew their application, and so that's where was kind of that vagueness as far as where where yeah. would it apply? I think we were very concerned to make sure that residents throughout the city uh, were treated equally. It didn't turn out that any off El Paseo were well positioned to take advantage of outdoor dining after the pandemic. Um, so when we approved uh, the current guidelines for two years, one of the questions that was left unresolved uh, was whether users of the public right of way uh, should pay some fee if that becomes more permanent because those restaurants that have invested a great deal uh, to create their own outdoor dining infrastructure were crying foul uh, at the prospect of competitors, in essence, um, receiving something from the public for free. So uh, has that issue been discussed with the Restaurant Association as this has bubbled up? I know that um, Eric uh, and Nick has, have been involved working with the, with the Merchants Association, looking at that broader um, you know, use of the right-of-way uh, for outdoor dining and are looking at that more comprehensively. Um, for, the, for for this um, particular item, it, it it was not brought up. Yeah, Councilmember Arnick. Okay, I'm going to ask to go back again a couple slides, if you would. So all we're looking at at this point, that dirt place that it was running parallel to the curb and on Larkspur that had a it was a planter before. Correct. We're just asking if what was a planter if they can bump that out and turn it into more concrete correct if you can go to slide one there it is right so that, that that's what was there about a month so ago. that existed before that was their property well it actually is an encroachment into the right-of-way that we could not find any um license agreement or uh permit for um but that was something that was All right. had, had My my gut reaction is that it's premature to prepare um, new ordinances or policies to apply to a broader area because we have these other lingering questions that we intended to come back to after the two-year experimental extension. I would suggest just dealing with this on a case-specific basis that there was a previously established encroachment and we're just going back to the previously established encroachment instead of letting this one little strip of land drive a whole new policy. What I'm seeing not. Okay. Yeah, I would agree, Mayor. Thank you. Yeah, I think the time that that has existed kind of I, I it, it gives them some rights because it's existed. And I think if we look at it, something like this, and I, I do think we take it by a case by case basis. For now. If, yeah, yeah for, for this specific one, and let's take care of it. And 
Uh, they were working hard to get that whole plaza together and to get work done. And they, they've had obstacle after obstacle and they've, they've stuck to it. So I'd like to see us allow them to uh, fix that up and, and continue doing business in our city. Okay. At work. At works. Thank you very much. All right. Does that conclude our study? So, uh, let's take a 10 minute break and then be back here to open a closed session in 10 minutes. Okay, thank you. Huh? Yeah. Um, it was supposed to be. Uh, yeah.